And so if you have your Bibles, please open up with me a familiar place of Scripture that continues to contain the depths of the riches and wisdom of God. This is the book of Matthew 5, 45 and 48. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The sermon that I would like to continue is called Called to Perfection. This promise contained in the commandment is the inheritance of the saints of all generations, and this commandment of Christ is addressed specifically to his students. Therefore, people who do not accept God's delegated authority over themselves have no part in the inheritance that is contained in this commandment and are not able to have it because they are not students. Relevant to fulfilling this required commandment, we stop to study the purpose of the righteousness of God in the heart of a man. Specifically, the goal is that the righteousness of God abiding within our heart is called to pursue, and in part we've been studying the purpose of the righteousness of God within our heart, received by us in the two broken tablets, in which we die by the law, for the law, to live for the one that died and resurrected, and by doing so receive confirmation of our salvation in the new tablets of the covenant, in the format of the law of the spirit of life, so that we provide God a basis to give us the promise to be heirs of peace, not by the law, but by the righteousness of faith, like he gave it to Abraham and his seed. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4.13 we note that the righteousness of faith is determined by the obedience of our faith to the faith of God. There is our faith and God's faith. God's faith is the word of God that comes out of his mouth. That is when it comes out of God's mouth that's then trusted to his uh, delegated ones and they preach it. This is the word of God and it's called faith. Our faith is obedience to the faith of God or information that comes from this faith. And so this faith is presented in the preached word of God sent together with that person who represents the fatherhood of God to us. It's in vain the person thinks that if he reads the scriptures and he will have faith this way. Faith is from hearing and not what you read. These are God's thoughts and we with our mind will not be able to understand them. And if you begin to uh, pervert them, trying to translate them with your own intellect. Therefore, the promise of peace is given only to those men that are obedient to the order of God in accordance to which God sends us his word by the mouth of his delegated people. When people say that they have their own personal Bible, their own personal head, then they in this way resist God and are not God's students. Therefore, the covenant of peace within the heart of man is the result of the obedience of his faith to the faith of God, which is the spoken word of God's delegated ones. In a specific format, we've already looked at six signs by which we need to determine and examine ourselves as to whether we are the sons of peace as well as the sons of God and have been studying the seventh sign. This is our ability to clothe our essence into the holy and selective love of God. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Colossians 3, 14, 15. We have noted that according to this place of scripture, the reign of the peace of God within our heart is possible only upon one condition, and that is if the selective love of God will abide within our heart, and if we will be clothed into the selective love of God. Selective, that means holy. Holy, that is selective. Since in the selective love of God, which is the atmosphere of the peace of God, we see concealed the good, wonderful, eternal, and uncomprehending for the human mind goals and works of God, called to build a unique and peaceful relationship between God and exclusively with his children. 
Christ loved his church and gave himself for her and washed her with pure waters by the word so she be holy and without blemish before him in love. The Lord loved not the whole world, but his church in the world, the chosen ones. We need to understand that the bride of Christ is always the church, but the church is not always the bride of Christ because the Greek word church a gathering of people but from this gathering of people God begins to choose his own that will be his body who responded to his call who are his chosen people in scripture the character of the selective love of God is presented by the Holy Spirit in scripture by the preached word of the apostles and prophets in the form of seven unchanging elements and these have become the subject of our study virtue knowledge self-control perseverance godliness brotherly kindness and love this is second peter one two through eight we note that each of these surprising qualities are the nature of the heavenly father and each of the seven qualities of the fruits of virtue are one and the other contain the characteristic of all of the other qualities which is why they flow one from the other complete one the other strengthen one the other and confirm the truthful nature of one the other second these qualities these seven characteristics are called to be the moral perfection within our heart and an example inherent to the essence of god Third, the given qualities are the great and precious promises entrusted to us through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. Fourth, the given qualities presented in the seven characteristics are the imperishable treasure and unsearchable wealth of Christ with which we need to become rich. Fifth, in order to receive the inheritance of these qualities, these seven unchanging characteristics, it is necessary for us to receive the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life. That is when we will be able to be led by the Holy Spirit, because infants are not led by the Holy Spirit, spiritual infants. It's written that they are tossed to and from by all kinds of wind of doctrine, by the uh, sneaky craftiness of men. And now the question, can these people belong to the to God when they're not being led by the Holy Spirit, but by all kinds of various winds of doctrine? Can they be a body, a part of the body of Christ? Of course not. People have fear. How? So when we're born, we're all infants. Yes, we are spiritual infants, but there are two categories of these infants in Scripture. There are infants that are students, and there are infants who don't consider themselves students in the order, within the order of God. They say, I listen to this one, third one, fourth one, and think that this is fine. But there are infants that understand that they have a father and they have a mother, and they need to listen to the voice only of their father and their mother, and run from others. There's this category of infants that from their birth know their mother and their father and will not follow other foreign voices. So there's a difference between infants, the categories of these infants. From that cat, but that category that is uh, tossed to and from, they will never be able to belong to the body of Christ. They have their opportunity to come out of this that is die for their nation for the house of their father and for their destructive or corrupt desires that this category always uh, states as their own personal goodness uh, I do this for the Lord I do this for the Lord the Lord can't leave me I do all these good things for him and I do it how he wants but the thing is it is our own goodness or virtue that is not God's goodness or virtue God saves not because of our godliness or what we do but what Jesus did and when we receive the justification that is from Jesus or by his work, that's when we do the right work. 
The means that we are to use for receiving the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life is the obedience of our faith to the faith of God. By inheriting these great and precious promises in the form of the fruits of our spirit, we become a part of God's divine nature, which is why the confessions then of the faith of our heart become equal in power to the words that come out of God's mouth. These seven characteristics is, are one fruit where these are these ingredients that are in one fruit that are one in the other the selective love of God demonstrated in the seven unchanging qualities and characteristics have nothing in common with and cannot have anything in common with the nature of human love that is filled with egoism greed and is just temporary and it is the power of the selective love of God in the format of seven qualities of unearthly virtue that is called to enthrone the resurrection of Christ in our earthly bodies, destroy the stronghold of death within our body, and clothe our earthly body into the resurrection of Christ that is into our new person. The bond of perfection of the selective love of God is unconditional when it comes to the seven qualities of virtue. Unlike the tolerant and egotistical love of men, the unconditional nature of the selective love of God and the seven qualities of virtue is different in that it contains the burning jealousy of God, all his knowledge and his absolute wisdom that in no way is able to be used for greedy and egotistical purposes and goals of man. At the same time, the tolerant love of man toward other men is very conveniently used for greedy and egotistical goals or purposes. Here is what the scriptures say regarding the strength of the love of God. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for the love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Songs of Solomon 867. We note that the measure of the love of God is identified by and is known by the measure of God's hatred toward evil and men who do this evil. The carriers again of this evil, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, he loved righteousness in those who carry righteousness and hated lawlessness in those who carry lawlessness, therefore God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions, Hebrews 1.9. There's no abstract righteousness and there's no abstract lawlessness. It is only when it's in a programmable system that is able to it is able to demonstrate itself, the programmable system being a person. He himself makes the decision between good and evil, and when he receives this lawlessness, he becomes a carrier of this lawlessness. When he receives this righteousness, he becomes a carrier of righteousness. Spiritual infants uh, receive this lawlessness and call it uh, righteousness, and those who truly carry righteousness, they call it lawlessness and resist them and don't understand them and rebel against them and want to be freed of them, and if it's not possible, then they just leave this kind of church. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. You see, he does not love everyone. In general, he loves the righteous one and he tests whether he is truly righteous. Does he truly love me or not? If he loves me, he will follow my commandments. And if he doesn't, he will just justif justify his acts uh, by saying that I can't do this, you see my weaknesses and and then a person makes the decision that it's actually God's profession to forgive he just has no way out or other choice he has to save me he always has a way out it is you who have no way out you want to trick God when you're trying to do this you already have tricked yourself and you will never be able to come out of there if you decide to speak to God in this kind of manner the Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the, love, the Lord is righteous, he loves the righteous, his countenance beholds the upright. Psalm 11, 5-7 
His countenance beholds the upright. God's countenance does not behold the lawless. God will never allow the lawless ones to see his face. That means that God allows the upright to see his face. Only loving what God loves and hating what God hates, we are able to demonstrate God's perfection in His reaction toward the righteous who perform good and the unrighteous who perform lawlessness. The selective love of God by its unchanging nature in the form of these, of these seven supernatural qualities is called to grow us into the fullness of growth in Christ or lead us into the perfection that is like the perfection of our Heavenly Father so that we can shine the light of our Son upon the just and unjust and pour out our reins according to God's intentions upon the righteous for good and the unrighteous to punish them. Considering, therefore, that these seven qualities of virtue identifying the selective love of God do not have an analog in the earthly realm of the human lexicon, not in any dictionaries of the world. The love of God is the foundation and the atmosphere of the moral and immovable law, opening within our heart the essence of God and the essence of the heavenly kingdom and God himself. And this is not all. The love of God agape is a sovereign love, which is unconditional when it comes to the people it chooses in its abilities to foreknow and predestine. For whom he foreknew, he also to foreknow is to know before the creation of the world, see ahead of time that this person that will be hearing the truth will not avoid it but will receive it and will make himself obedient to it. And that God then foreknows such a person, he also predestines them so he be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8.29 Because of its sovereignty, the selective love of God never violates the sovereign rights of those people she selects. And never, and God himself is able to God is able to wait until a person understands him and sometimes he has to wait the wait the entire life of a person the, his entire life all the years of his life until he makes this decision that he was not walking with God and was walking in the opposite direction it's good that if a person will realize this some at some point god can wait for a long time and not reject a person all the way till his, uh, till the day of his death so that he turn back to him and acknowledge him that's why it says i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i will come in and dine with him and he with me god will never knock upon the heart of a foolish person he only knocks upon the hearts of his children people have the understanding or mentality that God knocks upon every heart he passes by and knocks up upon every door no he does not knock upon every door he can't he only knocks to his own he came for his own and he knocks when he knocks that means that when the time comes to come out of this spiritual infancy childhood, uh, leave their nation, the house of their father, to leave their corrupt or destructive uh, desires, which we have uh, named as our own goodness or godliness. And he begins to knock when we leave these things. Before that time, he will not be knocking. Imagine you haven't left all of this. Your heart is unclean. That is, you're not cleansed from dead works and you open the door and you hear the voice. Do you think he will really enter and live in an unclean heart? That's absurd. He's knocking upon a clean heart and a clean heart that is able to hear him. He will never allow his own sovereign rights within his boundaries to be violated. These boundaries identified as his burning holiness. He does not violate the sovereign rights of the people he commu communicates with, but never allows his own rights to be violated as well. In a specific format, we've already looked at the demonstration of the selective love of God in the qualities of virtue, knowledge, self-control, and perseverance, and stopped to study the virtue of the love of God in the mystery of great godliness. 
And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. 1 Timothy 3.16 And all of this God does by his chosen ones. He himself doesn't do anything on earth, so angels would be able to see it. He does this by, uh, by his or through his church or using his church, that he, it may be known by the church to the principalities in heaven the many great works of God. By demonstrating the signs of the fruits of godliness, we identified the true quality of the love of God agape within the heart of a man in his words his actions, and the manner in which he dresses, which is very important. The gar clothing that is not supposed to prompt the instincts of the opposite gender. Further, we note that there is a fundamental difference, as we know, between the goodness of God in his favor toward man and the godliness of a man, which he is called to demonstrate in his love to God. For example, the godliness of man is his favor to God, is his grace to God and his thanksgiving. The godliness of a man is his ability to visit the fatherless and widow in their hardship and keep themselves from being defiled by the world. The godliness of a man is the ability to imitate Christ and meditate about the things of the hills and see God in his good, acceptable, and perfect will. The godliness of God or God's favor is his responsive reaction to that godliness or good, goodness of, of, of a man to, toward him. And so this is his goodness toward man as a response to the goodness that a man shows him, his favor and his grace toward man, his mercifulness to man and his thanksgiving toward man. This is his good work and his good acts, his kindness in the absolute sense of the word but only toward that person that has turned and walks toward him so that his deeds be revealed, those that have not been done in God, and God can cleanse him from it. Aside from these characteristics called to identify the character of godliness, there is also a counterfeit form of godliness that exists as well, that conflicts with or resists the true form of godliness, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. 2 Timothy 3, 5 If we don't break our relationship with people that have the look of godliness and will not distance ourselves from them, they will corrupt our godliness that is contained in our good habits, which is why we together with them will inherit the prepared for them destruction. Relevant to this fact, we have been looking at one of the signs contained in question 4. This is to be a cloud of God filled with His moisture and scattering His light and being turned by His guidance for correction or His land or for mercy to identify whether our uh, godliness is working with God's godliness, we have been studying this component. Job 37, 11 through 16, also with moisture he saturates the thick clouds, he scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about, being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. When we read that place uh, in the book of Matthew, he sends uh, rain on the just and unjust, as we read. He causes it to come whether for correction, Correction, or for his land or for his mercy. Listen to this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know when God dispatches them and causes the light of his cloud to shine? Which means that not all clouds are God's clouds. Do you know how the clouds are balanced, those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? Dispatching his clouds for correction or for his land or for mercy according to his will means to carry or be a carrier of the favor and punishment of the one that is perfect in knowledge. It's not possible to separate 
the one from the other, uh, they are one. This is one of the fundamental elements by which we need to examine ourselves as to whether we are collaborating our favor with the favor of God. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell severity toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Romans 11:22. The selective love of God, we see it here. If you will be within my favor, you will be within the boundaries of my my favor, then my favor will be open to you. If not, you will be then cut off, because you see my severity toward the, the those who fell, those who had my goodness, and when they fell away, my goodness toward them stopped, and my severity took that place. Demonstrating God's goodness toward one and his severity toward another, we become carriers of his justice within his holiness. The phrase, do you know when God dispatches them and causes the light of his cloud to shine, indicates the fact that not all clouds are able to be clouds that God dispatches and cause the light of it to shine, but only those clouds which God provides or those clouds that provide God a basis that they can contain his moisture in themselves. This is confirmed by another place of scripture. He binds up the water in his thick clouds. These are not empty clouds that are tossed to and from and that have no moisture. He binds up the water in his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken under it. He covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it. Job 26, 8, 9. God's throne is in, an, in a cloud, in his cloud, that is filled with his moisture. His throne does not have clouds that are tossed to and from by all kinds of deception. And to differentiate the clouds of the Most High in the form of the saints that fear God from profane to this nature clouds in the form of pseudo-saints that do not have in themselves the fear of the Lord, it is necessary for us to know that our ability to provide, provide God the basis to fill us with His moisture and our readiness to scatter His light and direct it according to His guidance is our function. By fulfilling this function, we demonstrate our favor to God. The function to fill us with moisture so that we can be led by the Holy Spirit and be turned by His guidance is God's favor, which is His response to our to Him favor, demonstrated in our readiness to fulfill or be filled with His moisture, which indicates our hunger and thirst to listen to the preached word of truth. Linked to this, relevant to this, it was necessary for us to study a series of questions. First, what virtues do the scriptures give the clouds of God? Second, what purpose does the cloud of God fulfill? Third, what conditions do we need to fulfill so that God establish us as his clouds? And fourth, by what sign do we determine that we are truly the clouds of the Most High? First, to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, it is necessary to scatter your light from your cloud upon the just and unjust and pour out the receive from God moisture in the form of rain upon the righteous and the unrighteous. Second, we are called to release the moisture we have from the Heavenly Father in the form of rain and scatter His light according to His will and not according to our whims or conclusions. In the New Testament, the meaning consisting in the purpose of being a cloud of God is laconically presented in the following words. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. Not those that are tossed to and from by all wind of trick, uh, trickery teachings or uh, winds of doctrine that are deceptive, but those that are led by the Spirit of God. It's very tragic. It's unfortunate that the most part people speak in tongues are not able to be led by the Spirit of God because they have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and think that they've received the Holy Spirit himself, the individual Holy Spirit, and the fact that they speak in tongues they think is the Holy Spirit. This is your Spirit that speaks. This is not the Holy Spirit that speaks, but your Spirit that speaks. When we are being baptized, the Holy Spirit gives us the gift 
to be able to speak so that by this gift we can then submerge ourselves into the death of the Lord Jesus. But when a person is not taught what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is and how to use this uh, language of tongues, he will never be able to be submerged into the death of the Lord Jesus. They'll speak phrases, but these phrases will not uh, impact him the way they need to. Which means that if we are not in accordance to the requirements of a cloud of God capable of being filled with his moisture and scattering his light for the purpose of correcting one and demonstrating mercy upon another, then our sonhood needs to be seriously questioned. When it talks about clouds lacking moisture, who are tossed to and fro by all kinds of deceptive teachings that are profane to God, we have been studying the category of people located within the church of saints that do not have the spirit of the Lord and resist the spirit of the Lord. Apostle uh, Paul in Corinth writes to the church in Corinth, you don't have an insufficiency in any gift, but you are infants, and I cannot speak to you as people that are spiritual, you're still carnal. And so, when you speak in tongues and practice spiritual gifts, uh, doesn't yet mean that you have the Holy Spirit. We've, we've been looking at the clouds of the Most High as the category of saints that are led by the Holy Spirit by the means of their new person, created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth. And this means that the clouds of the Most High can only be those saints that have grown into full measure of growth in Christ and are in accordance to the demands of perfection that is inherent to God. Further, we've noted that the clouds of the Most High that are within God's possession is a symbol of his great mystery and is called to fulfill a vital role in the work of adopting and redeeming our body from the law of sin and death. In scripture, the clouds of the Most High are a symbol of the glory of God, the place where God abides, the clothes into which God dresses, and the midst from which the Lord speaks. In a specific format, as much as the Lord has allowed in the measure of our faith, we already looked at the first three questions and will therefore pay attention to and study now the fourth question. By what signs do we need to determine that we are the clouds of the Most High? The first sign by which uh, I wanted to pay attention to, by which we can examine ourselves as to whether we are the clouds of the Most High, consists in our deliverance from Egyptian slavery. To the chief musician, to Jedathan, a psalm of Asaph. Asaph received a revelation uh, for the psalm. He pretty much wrote the music to it and gave it to another chief musician, Jedathan, although he himself was also a chief of musician and uh, Asaph was a seer of the Lord or a seer of David and the Lord. Psalm 77, 1 through 20. You have with your arm redeemed your people and the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O Lord. The waters saw you. They were afraid. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The, sk the sky sent out a sound. Your arrows also flashed about. Do you think, why, did, why was all this happening? The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind, and the lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters, and the footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And so these events, these things that took place that it's describing, God led by the hand of Moses and Aaron, his nation, out of Egypt. This is the exodus of the nation of, of Israel out of Egypt. The saints who have not allowed God to deliver them from Egypt, Egyptian slavery, which is identified as the position of spiritual infancy, will never be able to be led by the Holy Spirit because they are attracted by various winds of deceptive doctrine, by the trickery of men and sneaky forms of crafty deception, which is why they are not able to be filled and be the clouds of God that are filled with his moisture and pour out his moisture in the form of rain according to God's guidance as correction for one and as mercy for another, they're not able to be the body of Christ. 
The words and melody of this psalm belong to the seer Asaph, the chief of one of three choirs formed by King David. It is noteworthy that in order to perform the psalm before the face of the Lord in the tabernacle of David, Asaph gave the psalm in control of the chief musician, Jeduthun. The principle of such collaboration where the revelation of Asaph, the seer of King David, is given in control of the chief musician, Jeduthun, indicates the order where God on earth in each generation and in each individual person will deliver the chosen by him remnant from the Egyptian slavery of their soul. Here we see the order of deliverance of a person from Egypt, and the essence of this principle consists in delivering an individual person from Egyptian slavery. This person needs to place himself in dependence of the order of the choir, that is, the chosen by God flock that is being directed by the chief musician. Not all can be choir directors, but only those that are chosen, and God in the form of this choir shows the chosen by God flock, the body of Christ. That is being directed by the chief musician, who, which is the Holy Spirit. So if a person consciously and voluntarily does not acknowledge and resists in the Church of Saints the order that exists in the body of Christ, that is the Church of the living God, such a person does not belong to the body of Christ, the order of the body. We always see the body of Christ in the body of man, and there's one head there and one head there. And so what order exists in the body? Because of this order, the inner organs work and function properly. And the outer members uh, depend on the inner members or organs. My hands, the work of my legs, my hands, the ability to see, to be able to smell and hear. And all of them, t all of it together depend on our head. And as soon as one of the cells suddenly in some way uh, becomes independent from the mind and the mind can't control it, this member by the medics is called a, a cancerous cell because it has uh, become independent and cannot be nourished and be cleansed. Every specific cell in the body has a program to receive as much as the head gives to it and cleanse and, and the ability to be cleansed. And the Holy Spirit does all of this inside of ourselves as the blood does in our physical body. Blood gives life to our cells. But in order to bring forth this nourishment this to the cells, we need a specific oils. If a person eats his food without any kind of oils, then his food cannot be uh, pretty much the nutrition of it is not able to uh, benefit his cells. It's actually tossed out and this nourishment uh, is not uh, as beneficial. So anything that you eat, you need to add a little bit of oil. And so this uh, applies to most kinds of things that we may be consuming in general, including uh, drink and food. The scriptures say if we walk in the light as he is in the light and have communication with one another or fellowship, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so cleansing from sin uh, depends on our correct uh, fellowship with one the other. If we don't have fellowship with one the other and we can't forgive our brother, then God will not forgive us our sins or trespasses. We need to understand that. The name a Asaph means God has taken upon himself the responsibility of his nation or a gatherer of the nation to meet the Lord in the air. That's the name or definition of the name Asaph. 
If a pastor who stands as head of a specific church of saints does not possess the power of Asaph, then such a church does not have the legitimate right to the freedom or deliverance from Egyptian slavery, and furthermore does not have the right to get together to meet the Lord in the air. I don't mean the name itself, uh, Asaph, but the essence of this godly inspired allegory is presented by Asaph, this epic battle that we see here where the Lord delivers his people from Egyptian slavery. The symbol of delivering us from the Egyptian slavery is a symbol of destroying within our body the stronghold of death and delivering our body from uh, this slavery of the old person with his deeds. As much as we know, this event is also described in the book of Prophet Hosea when the nation of Israel, the exodus of these people from Egypt, and he associates it with the promises that God's remnant is to receive before rapture, and this is destroying the stronghold of death in our body and erecting the stronghold of life in its place. This needs to happen before rapture. It happens before rap uh, uh, un until the time of, of rapture as well, but we proclaim it as non-existent, the existent as uh, the non-existent as existent, and truly before the rapture time, then our body will begin to see, experience these changes, and us not being raptured uh, for a few more years will be able to present the greatness and glory of God here on earth and this will be our guarantee that we will be raptured therefore I behold will allure her her meaning his God's remnant I will allure her will bring her into the wilderness a symbol of sanctification and speak comfort to her I will give her in the sanctification vineyards from there and the valley of Accor at the door of her hope this is the time of our uh, th before our rapture she shall sing there as in the days of her youth as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt Hosea 2 14 15 in Hebrew, the verb to redeem, used in reference to redeeming the nation of God from Egyptian slavery, has a convincing semantic when talking about the relationship of God with a man who has an organic membership to the category of the chosen of God remnant in the form of the bride of the Lamb. In Hebrew, the word redeem is to redeem from sin and death, to purchase from slavery of sin and death, to return the lost possession, free from debt by paying it, to protect with yourself from the power of sin and death, to heal from sicknesses that are inflicted by sin, to save from hell and death, to destroy the stronghold of death in the body of man, to erect the stronghold of life in the body of man, to adopt by redeeming the body of man, to lead a person into the inheritance of Jesus Christ, and make the body of a man your eternal home. The phrase, you have with your arm redeemed your people, the word arm in Hebrew indicates the power and order of the kingdom of God, by the power with which God destroyed in the body of man the stronghold of death and replaced it with the stronghold of life in the body of man. The arm of God in Hebrew is his hand, his shoulder, his strength, his might, support, military strength, army, yeast, fermented dough. For me, it's very uh, interesting, this uh, thought that is contained, that, that identifies God's arm. We need to know that the arm of God will positively impact a person upon the condition that this man is an organic member of the body of Christ in the form of the wife, the bride of the Lamb, which upon practice means that this person will possess the virtue of a student as a lamb belonging to a flock that God led out of Egypt by the hand of Moses and Aaron. We will keep in mind that 
all that God do, did, does, and will do with his arm, he always does, did, does, and will do by man that possesses the virtue of his cloud or is led by the Holy Spirit, considering the fact that the arm of God has very many meanings, and these are many meanings of his power, we need to look at the essence of these definitions of the arm of God and how they apply in our life. First, the arm of God is demonstrated in the act of us considering ourselves dead to sin and living for God, proclaiming the non-existent as existent. Considering yourself dead to sin and living for God and proclaiming the not existent as existent, we in this way provide heaven the proper grounds or basis in our essence similar to the yeast to ferment our spirit, soul, and body in their entirety or completely. Another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened, Matthew 13.33. Three measures of meal, spirit, soul, and body. And we know perfectly that in the body, the throne of God is the rod of our mouth that confesses God's faith. In the soul, the throne of God is the renewed mind. In the spirit is his conscience from which the place that God judges a man. The arm of the Lord in the form of the yeast of God which ferments the dough demonstrates itself in the act of when we receive the word into our heart about the kingdom of heaven that is within our body. Because until in our body we have this corruption, we become older, we become sick, in our body we don't have the kingdom of heaven or and not the throne of God but the throne of Satan that is our old person who is a programmable system of the fallen cherubim second the arm of God as the shoulders of God is demonstrated in the act of when we confess who God is to us in G upon the shoulders of Jesus you know upon the shoulders of the high priest there were two stones this is authority with the six names engraved upon each stone and this was a memorial before God and shoulders uh, mean uh, the God's power this is when we confess who God is for us in Jesus Christ or the shoulders of Jesus and who God is to us upon the shoulders of Jesus then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave them on the names of the sons of Israel six of their names on the one stone and six names on the other stone in order of their birth with the work of an engraver in stone like the engraving of a signet you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel you shall set them in settings of, of gold you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel so Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial the arm of the Lord by which he led the people out third the arm of God as the personified strength of God is demonstrated in the act of us receiving the Holy Spirit into our heart as the Lord and the master of our life behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come to him and dine with him and he with me to him who overcomes I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne ha he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches Revelation 3 21 through 20 in order to lead from out of Egypt you need the throne you need this power fourth the arm of God as his might is demonstrated in the act of us timely confessing the faith of God abiding within our heart the arm of God as his might is the supernatural ability of God independent from all circumstances to fulfill his word which he has magnified above all his name in the temple of our body in the time he has appointed he who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful, and a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment, because for every matter there is a time and judgment, though the misery of a man increases greatly, for he does not know what will happen, so who will tell him what will when will it occur? Ecclesiastes 8, 5 through 7. When a person knows the commandment, and this is the arm of God, God by the power of his commandment, 
when we're obedient to his commandments, we see the supernatural power by which God will lead us out. We will know what to proclaim when. Fifth, the arm of God as a support of God is demonstrated in the act of when we hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who has promised is faithful. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure waters. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10, 22. In other words, independent from what we feel or what circumstances may surround us, we are called to confess not what we feel, but the information, who God is for us in Jesus Christ, what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, and who we are to God in Jesus Christ. Sixth, the arm of God as the military strength of God is demonstrated in the act of us confessing with the word of God abiding within the heart in the form of the faith of God as various forms of God's arms or weaponry. Finally, we brethren, by, by strength in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to be withstanding an evil day having done all this. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shot our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. And so not, again, having this armor, we will not be able to withstand the evil day or be a part of the body of Christ. Not having this armor, we will not be able to be saved, we will not be able to be led out of Egypt. The arm of God, as the army of God, is demonstrated in the act of us walking in the light as he is in the light and having fellowship with one another. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1.7 these characteristics of God's arm are very well shown in the blessings with which Moses blessed his the sons of Israel before his death. There's no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides the heavens to help you and in his excellency on the clouds. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say destroy. Then Israel shall dwell in safety. The fountain of Jacob alone in a land of grain and new wine. His heavens shall also drop, de drop dew. Happy are you, O Israel, who, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help. In order to be led out of Egypt, you need to see the land before you that is with grain and new wine and what God has prepared for his body. If a person doesn't see what God has prepared for his body, he will not be able to come out of Egypt. He will not be want to come out of Egypt. Only when you see that the reward is great and better than what you have now, you will want to then leave what you have now. Why can a person not leave his sins? Because it hasn't been presented to him the beauty and the greatness of what God has prepared for him in his body. Happy are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. Your enemies shall submit to you and you shall tread down their high places. The battle between the new and old person and is a, a, the new person who carries eternal life and the old person that has the law of sin and death and a carrier of the law of sin and death. 
We see in the phrase how the water saw you, the water saw, saw you, and the clouds poured out your moisture. And so the waters of death as the sea that had been divided by the rod of Moses and the people then became afraid and trembled before God. Also symbolized as the earthquake that happened within the body of a person by destroying the stronghold of death in their bodies. This didn't happen when their bodies, when they were passing by, of course, or passing through the uh, uh, Dead Sea when it was parted. God saw, showed this symbol uh, as uh, delivering the human body from the stronghold of death the phrase your way is in the sea talks about the route that the Lord has placed to be able to reach the goal of redeeming our body from sin and death that happens amongst these great waters of death here's the result of this epic battle Here's Apostle Paul described, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not in his, not in him. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raises Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If our bodies uh, die, then the Holy Spirit doesn't live in them, but it's talking about the bodies in which the Holy Spirit does live. Your mortal bodies through His Spirit will dwell in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Romans 8, 5 through 14. The church could not possibly understand if it's possible that our mortal body can be delivered from the uh, law of sin and death here on earth. And so to examine yourself as to whether you are a cloud of God is necessary by the men your mentality that is renewed by the spirit of your mind. For as he, th he thinks in his heart, so is he, Proverbs 23, 7. So if we are able to focus our mind and keep it uh, and have it meditate about the unsurgible inheritance of Christ, <clears throat> that the Lord has delivered our body already from law, the law of sin and death and <coughs> proclaimed the not existent as existent, then this is evidence of the fact that we are the clouds of God. And if the promise that is in the unsearchable uh, riches of Christ take hold of us and become our nourishment and our drink, quenching our spiritual hunger and thirst, then this is evidence again of the fact that we are the clouds of God. Amen. Let us bend our knees and pray. And those who desire to con uh, resist the instincts of the flesh, your emotions, the sin that you are bound by, the fear that you have because of the illnesses you may have, the Lord is here to deliver you and prepare you so that you can take part in this great mystery, this holiness, so that it can do the work within your body, do the work of, of God's life within you. Amen. I'm going to be praying with you your prayer, and I ask you to deeply believe that the Lord is for you, He isn't against you, and everything He said He's able to do. And if you experience pain, because of sin that has been done, and you hate sin, and you want to be free, from these 
chains of slavery. The Lord is on your side. The Lord is able to deliver you from the fear of illness, fear of untimely death, and fear of dependence of sins, whichever sin it may be. Lift your hands to God. This is your secret room. Close your eyes. This is your opportunity to receive from the Lord what He wants to give you. So pray together with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you. I open up my heart. You see my sin. You see my shame. You see my fear. You see my fear because of the illnesses I have, the poverty I have, untimely death, I hate sin, I hate my dependence from my soul, from my nation, the house of my father, and my corrupt desires. And I ask you right now before heaven and hell, and I deny the sin, I deny my old person, I love you, I receive your justification and salvation into my heart as the pearl of my salvation. I rejoice in it, I will keep it, and I believe that it is the one that will destroy the stronghold of death within my body and erect the stronghold of life. I thank you, I worship before you, our great God, Son and Holy Spirit, Amen. May the Lord bless you. May He look upon you with His great face and show you mercy and give you peace. May thousands and ten thousands attempt to come near you, but they won't touch you. May the blessings of the heavens, the blessings of the depths that lie beneath and the Blessings of the ancient mountains, may they be upon you and upon your children and be fulfilled upon you, and the nation shall say, Amen. The Lord is blessed who is vigilant over his word so that he may fulfill it. And as soon as you confess your sins and have received justification, then independent of what you feel, the information has begun working within your bodies. I trust that after all that we've been through just now, that we're now ready, that we've done now, we are ready now to take part in this great mystery. First Corinthians 11, 23 through 32. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so not his neighbor, but himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, examining not himself, but his neighbor, then he eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves then we would not be judged but when we are judged we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world and so anyone and everyone who has received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior into their heart and has confirmed 
a covenant with God by baptism of water can take part in this communion, a heart of a person that is uh, filled with bitterness and unforgiveness should not take part. A person who has secret sins within their heart and has not confessed them cannot take part. A person who is uh, placed under warning for whatever reason should not take part. All the rest, independent of whether you're a member or not of the specific church, you can take part. I will ask everyone to stand and we will pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for this mystery, this holy bread that represents your broken body when it will be eaten by your people. May your mercy be shown to us and may in our body the stronghold of death be destroyed and the stronghold of life be erected in its place that is within this body, this bread. We thank you for it and we worship before you our great God and Holy Sp Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And it is written that he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, split shared among it among you split it among you you may sit down those that will take part you see I broke it you need to do the same thing to break it is to humble yourself before the Lord and acknowledge the fact that my sins broke the body of Christ for as often as you eat this bread or drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes For often, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This is one of the great mysteries and celebrations. Every time we do this, this is a celebration that make the heavens rejoice. They don't mourn at this time. They rejoice and are glad because this is a celebration of the Lord, a feast of the Lord, where you don't mourn and you're not saddened when the nation of Israel, during one of these uh, Passover feasts, when they had for many years not honored this Passover feast, when they returned from the, their slavery and the temple was built and sanctification took place and they had a Passover feast as it didn't happen for a long time the nation began to mourn the priests became afraid and told the nation to stop this is a feast this is a celebration this is joy stop mourning is it sad when you are delivered from Egypt you come out with rejoicing and song the nations rejoice, the heavens rejoice, the nations of God. The Lord has done his work. Hell can mourn, let the unclean mourn, and the lawless, they can mourn, but we will rejoice. And if there are tears, there will be tears of joy. There's a difference between tears of sorrow and tears of joy. The bread of sorrow and the bread of joy. You eat the bread of joy because you are receiving life within yourself. I, until a specific time, did not understand why the Lord needed this. 
Why this physical bread becoming the body of Christ after it's blessed, why it's needed for us? We are spirit. The new person is Im immortal. Why would we need then? This is necessary for our mortal body to destroy within the body the stronghold of death. That's why it's necessary. And when you know what you're doing, then you are clothing yourself into celebration and victory, even if you have pain in your body and uh, this decay, this uh, aging, this process of aging is existing still in the body. You've already received this eternal youth within yourself. And at a specific time, as you know this now, you've written it upon your heart and the reader is able to read it. He will do this work. He will not be able to do it in the bodies who didn't know this promise, those who don't un who understood it but didn't clearly write this upon their heart so that the reader, when it comes time to fulfill this, uh, he can come and easily read it upon your heart when it's inscribed and clearly written there what you're doing. So as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Death for the old person so that the stronghold of life may be within your body. I will ask everyone to stand and we will bend our heads before the new cup of the covenant. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for the new cup poured out for the forgiveness of sins and when it will be passing by your people and we will take of it and drink of it, may your favor be upon us and the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of your resurrection, may he bring forth and build the stronghold of life in our body. We thank you and worship before you, our great God, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The row that is approached, please stand. And just as you assisted each other uh, in the bread, please also assist each other in taking of the cup. The cup is Jesus. One cup for all generations, for all. This is Jesus who was slain for us. For as often as you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. the Passover feast and in Egypt as well as in the Canaanite land happened with psalms and one of these psalms of David that was commanded to sing and those who would gather together at the table, the father of the family would tell the family what Pesach was, that this was an exodus from Egypt. Pesach is being delivered from the slavery of Egypt, the deliverance of our body from decay and death. And here's the psalm. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Blessed is the man. This place of scripture is referring to all men and women, all children of all ages and all social statuses or positions because in scripture when it's talking about a man is a person who's able to confess the faith of his heart in Jesus Christ there's no male or female gender 
there is the functions of a male and female. The function of a woman is receiving the word of God. The function of a man is confessing the word of God because confession is a seed. And so when you confess the faith of your heart, you hear the promise and you say, may it be according to your word, then you clothe yourself into a blessed man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in this path of the sinners because many sisters often uh, become saddened why is it the word of God always uh, referring to men or sons and very rarely refers to daughters the daughter of Zion and a daughter of Zion includes both men and women as well you see the bride of, of the lamb men and women also are there so we need to understand that this is a spiritual word it does not in any way diminish a woman and Jesus Christ this doesn't exist all are equal and specifically when it's referring to a man, blessed is the man, that means is a person who confesses the faith of his heart. If there's anyone who has been accidentally passed by, please stand so we may assist you. If not, I will ask everyone to stand and we will proclaim our unchanging manifestation by finishing this triumphant service. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.